Good evening. It's great for you to come here. About 135 years ago, Frederick Douglass announced that there's absolutely nothing new to say about Abraham Lincoln. I'm hoping against hope that he's wrong, but everybody's got an opinion. Uh, February the 10th, uh, Paul Kugman writes, uh, Abraham Lincoln inflationist. Two days later, Alan Guelzu, who probably has spoken here several times, uh, writes a response. Yesterday, as I'm finishing up my, t uh, my, my presentation, uh, Stephen Hahn writes about what Lincoln meant to slaves. I'm getting the impression that every time I turn around, there's a reference to Abraham Lincoln, including this cartoon that I just cu cut out of the morning newspaper. He basically says that uh, he stuck with Rutherford B. Hayes. How come he couldn't get somebody cool like Lincoln? or like uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who had to basically chew on wood to keep his teeth from growing. And the teacher then asks, uh, you sure that's not in the text? So uh, basically, the challenge is to say something that you haven't already heard about Abraham Lincoln. And there's, nobody has been more written about. Uh, nobody has been more discussed. Uh, there are literally armies devoted to writing about Lincoln. So I'm hoping that Frederick Douglass is wrong and that Maybach can offer something of a little bit of a different interpretation. So let's set the scene. A crowd of people is gathered before the Lincoln Memorial. The president speaks. Why is Lincoln, of all the American presidents, more revered not only in America but in the world? He freed the slaves. He saved the Union, died of an assassin's bullet just at the height of his career. He had humility, humor, feeling, and kindness, and perhaps more than anything else, the strength, the poise under pressure. When we examine the American presidents, the president went on, it is quite clear that no present history was more vilified or was more vilified during the, his time than Lincoln. Those who knew him have written that he was deeply hurt but what was said about him and drawn about him. But on the other hand, Lincoln had the great strength of character never to display it, always to stand tall and strong and firm no matter how harsh or unfair the criticism might be. And then the president concluded, even Lincoln would have marveled if he were living today, this nation, now the strongest nation in the world, the richest nation by far in the world, a nation greatly respected all over the world, and the question he would have asked, as we must ask ourselves, is how will history look back on our time? Now forget the fact that there's kind of a non sequitur here, he's kind of switching topics, but let's be honest, it's hard to remember any president of the United States, any politician in recent memory, who didn't attempt to associate himself with Lincoln. Getting right with Lincoln is one of the great American pastimes. Senator Obama announced his candidacy for presidency here in Springfield in the shadow of the old state capitol where he said Lincoln once called a house divided to stand together. He took the oath of office on the Bible Lincoln had used to be sworn in in his first inaugural. The luncheon after the inauguration was modeled on food Lincoln ate. The first course was even served on replica of China that Mary Todd Lincoln had picked out. Both were tall and skinny. Both had father issues. Both opposed the war. Both had thin resumes. Both had a genuine literary style. And both had their careers launched by a speech. But the words I've just spoken were not Obama's. They were Richard Nixon's. Richard Nixon was trying to compare what he was undergoing through Watergate to Abraham Lincoln. See, everybody, even Richard Nixon, gets to have his own personal Lincoln. Everybody gets to associate themselves with his virtues. Everybody gets to feel sorry for themselves by recounting their trials and tribulations and comparing them to those that he endured. Everybody gets to feel smart because they alone knew the real Lincoln and how, what he would have done had he lived. He is portable. He is adaptable. And even at six feet four, he is surprisingly easy to insert into any argument. For some, he is the North Star, the better angels of our nature, our aspirational American. For others, right and left, he is the biggest catch. 
Precisely because he is so beloved by so many, he poses the greatest threat. Whether you agree with President Reagan's former nominee to head the National Endowment for the Humanities, that Lincoln represented the beginnings of big government and that pernicious doctrine of social equality, or agree with Leron Bennett, that he was the embodiment, not the transcendence, of American racism, Lincoln's life and legacy are still subjects of vigorous debate. My students also have their personal Lincoln. One recently wrote, and I'm just doing midterms, the Emancipation Proclamation was merely a war measure created by Lincoln in order to win the war. Originally, Lincoln wanted to win the war and reunite the Union. Abolishing slavery became a secondary measure that evolved into a major point. This is what he wrote, word for word. Another student wrote, Lincoln's attitude towards slavery was one of violent hatred. Lincoln was a strong abolitionist. Well, we know he wasn't. Unrelenting in his goal to end slavery through the Civil War. Now, these are two boys, friends. They sit next to each other in class. They heard the same discussions. They read the same documents. They see two different Lincolns. They see Lincoln through the prism of their own lives, their own hopes, and their own experiences. Well, what about African Americans? How did they see Lincoln? I can refer back to the article in the New York Times yesterday by Stephen Hahn. He points out something I have to note, that is that they knew about Lincoln uh, and they knew about the election long before the Emancipation Proclamation, that he elevated their hopes and expectations uh, that they would be set free. Uh, one Virginia plantation, a group celebrated his inauguration by marching off their owner's land. In Louisiana, a runaway told his captors that the North was fighting for the Negroes. They weren't. And that he was as free as his master. As one slaveholder said, uh, they simply know too much about this Lincoln. After the Emancipation Proclamation, blacks viewed Lincoln as a great man who'd done a wonderful thing. They identified with his humble origins. They identified him with Moses. After all, he was the first president of the United States to actually invite African Americans into the White House that black slaves had built. After his assassination, thousands of black mourners were among the throngs that lined the 1,700-mile funeral route from New York to Springfield. I like actually bringing Springfield in about every two or three paragraphs. <laughs> These were Old Testament people. The Old Testament had helped reaffirm their humanity in a world that remorsefully, remorselessly denied it. They were God's children as much as any other man. And if these strangers in a strange land were wearied by their bondage, they knew that old Massa and old Missus would surely get theirs in the fiery flames of hell and that they would be rewarded by and by. These were Old Testament people. They knew that another Moses had led another children of Israel out of another house of bondage. But African American people are by testament. They're equally New Testament folk. They were Jesus folk. Not merry folk or even the remote and unknowable God folk, but Jesus folk. For it was Jesus who died on a cross for their sins so that they might be washed in his blood and have eternal life. Jesus, who died for them just like Lincoln did. It reaffirmed for them that the world was not just, not even for some white folks. That good can triumph even in the midst of great evil. That a brighter day is coming. In 1865, with Abraham Lincoln's body still aboard his funeral train, it stopped in New York. A Philadelphia Inquirer reporter overheard an uh, old black man say, he was crucified for us. Black soldiers led his funeral procession. Just before the procession had begun to move, the 22nd United States Colored Infantry, organized in Pennsylvania, landed in Petersburg and marched up to Washington, D.C. As they were coming up Pennsylvania Avenue, they saw the column coming. They played a dirge, and they headed the procession into the Capitol. Now, at the end of this parade, in their proper place by one estimate, were 40,000 newly freed blacks, walking slowly, heads bowed, holding hands. But remember, blacks had to fight 
for mere inclusion in the public grief. The mayor and the city council of New York ordered that no black people were to be allowed to take part in the procession from City Hall to the Hudson River Depot. Originally, a contingent of 5,000 African Americans had planned to take part until the orders came down. Finally, a telegram arrived. Secretary of War Stanton ordered New York to let black mourners march, but by then it was too late. Only about 300 blacks remained to take their place at the tail of the procession. 56 policemen were assigned to precede and follow them so that the white mourners would not attack them. Let me repeat that. 56 policemen in New York City were assigned to precede them and follow them so that the white mourners would not attack the black mourners. Well, I could spend a lot of time talking about their contemporary response, but let's talk about Springfield. Remember, we have to talk about Springfield every two or three paragraphs. It's in my contract. Robert Wilson McCauley recalled, the most pathetic sight to me was the intense grief manifested by the colored people, thousands of whom had journeyed for days in order to be in Springfield at the funeral. In addition to their section in the procession, they were assigned a place extending from the then city limits toward the cemetery, and there thousands of them massed. Every one of them, it seemed, had possessed his or herself some badge or token that would indicate their grief. Sometimes it was a simple piece of black cloth or crepe, not longer than a man's hand. Others had secured black handkerchiefs. All who could afford it had clothed themselves entirely in black. And as the beer passed, almost every one of them either knelt or prostrated himself or herself upon the ground and gave way to a touching demonstration of grief. Yet even in these earliest days, African Americans were very clear-eyed about who Abraham Lincoln was. And so I go back to that 1876 remark by Frederick Douglass. Lincoln, he said, was preeminently the white man's president. And remember, he knew Lincoln. He'd visited the White House three times entirely devoted to the welfare of white men. He was ready and willing at any time during the first years of his administration to deny, postpone, and sacrifice the rights of humanity in the colored man to promote the welfare of the white people in this country. To race, the race to which we, black people, belong was not the special objects of his consideration. But then Douglas went on. Nevertheless, he said, the name of Abraham Lincoln was near and dear to our hearts in the darkest and most perilous hours of the Republic. This was because black people were able to take a comprehensive view of Abraham Lincoln and make a reasonable allowance for the circumstance of his position. Though the Union was more to him than our freedom or our future, Douglas went on, blacks loved, understood, and most importantly, were forgiving of a man whom he described as the white man who shared the prejudices common to his countrymen toward the colored race, yet overcame them to offer freedom and promote social justice. These are the key words. Comprehensive view and reasonable allowance. A people enchained knows something about living in a world of limitations. Before the 1850s, Lincoln didn't seem to care much about slavery. He was more interested in economic issues like banking and the tariff. But Lincoln always opposed slavery. By the way, yes, I did, and it happens about every few years, I did get one essay in which somebody talked about Lincoln owning slaves. Again, in my class, read the same documents. Maybe it was just a slip of the tongue. I usually also get an essay sometime later on about Booker T. Washington as a great white man. The point is that Lincoln always opposed slavery. In October of 1854, Lincoln said, when the white man governs himself, that is self-government. But when he governs himself and also governs another man, that is more than self-government. That is despotism. If the Negro is a man, why then my ancient faith tells me that all men are created equal. 
and that there can be no moral right in connection with one man's making a slave of another. This is 1854. Was Lincoln a product of his time? Of course he was. Is there one among us who is not? Some take a, seem to take a, plus, uh, a, 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 a perverse pleasure in reminding us of Lincoln's words. But let me remind you of something else he said. I, count, I protest against the counterfeit logic that concludes that because I do not want a black woman for a slave, I must necessarily want her for a wife. I need not have her for either. I can leave her alone. In some respects, she is certainly not my equal. But in her natural right to eat the bread she earns with her own hands, without asking leave of any one else, she is my equal and the equal of all others. That's a powerful statement. And the fact that he chose a black woman, not a black man, makes it all the more interesting. Lincoln was never an abolitionist. And I do think in the 1850s he was more committed to a free labor ideology than any swift end to this immoral enterprise. But this is what Frederick Douglass concluded in 1876. The most important thing to remember about Lincoln is that in his heart of hearts, he always loathed and hated slavery. Now, I do believe that Lincoln saw slavery and equality as two separate issues. He was a man of his time. I remind you that we're in the state of Illinois. Illinois was a state that then had the black laws. We don't have any evidence that Lincoln was actually offended by or opposed to the black laws. Blacks couldn't marry, serve on juries, testify against whites in courts, intermarry with whites, serve in the militia. In America, you are innocent until proven guilty, but the burden of proof was on black people to prove that they were not runaway slaves. And even free, they had to pay a bond to ensure their good behavior. This was a state that legally required the whipping of any runaway slave until they left the state. After 1853, it was illegal for any black person to enter the state. Lincoln was a Henry Clay Whig, and Henry Clay owned slaves. Lincoln hoped that by constraining the institution, it would gradually wither away and die. Well, it took a bloody war, but how long should we have waited to avoid that bloody war? Ten years? Thousands and thousands of good men and women, young boys, died in that battle. Ten years, seems reasonable. About 20 years. How about letting slavery live another 20 years to avoid that awful war? Okay. How about 100 years to avoid a bloody civil war? If we waited 100 years, I would have become an adult as a slave. I take it personally. But the war did come, and like many, I believe that the war changed Lincoln. In the first years, he was still talking about colonization, trying to keep the border states neutral, still offering compensated emancipation. Uh, but near the end of his life, he was committed to ensuring an end to the institution of slavery and an inclusion, even if modest, even if tentative, of some African Americans into full civic participation. He weathered the Peace Democrats and even some, some Republicans. Horace Greeley's my favorite. Horace Greeley in 1862 is begging him to end slavery. Horace Greeley in 1864 is actually, actually asking him to use slavery as a kind of bargaining chip to negotiate with the Confederates. See, after a string of union victories, everybody thought the war was going to be over by the 4th of July in 1864. And when it wasn't, everybody got nervous, except Lincoln. They tried a, an in run, a little negotiation in, from Niagara Falls. Some of the Confederates came down from Canada. Lincoln said, sure, I'd be happy to talk with you as long as ending slavery is part of the negotiations. That's something that I won't trade away. He goes to the 1864 Republican National Convention. And he demands that the 13th Amendment be made the centerpiece of their national platform, once set on a course for Lincoln there would be no retreat. But I would remind you that Lincoln changed in part because he was forced to change. Thousands of black contraband who voted with their feet and made their way to Union lines sped up the dialectic forced the issue. 
pressed for freedom. These were living, breathing referendums on the institution of slavery. 180,000 black men in uniform forced Lincoln to change his mind. Remember, Lincoln insisted on playing these black soldiers half of what he paid white soldiers. Maybe uh, he feared that pay equality would bring about desertion of whites in the army. Some blacks spoke up. Some blacks were summarily hanged for speaking up. Some black units refused to take any money whatsoever. If we're not going to receive equal pay, we won't accept a dime. But day by day, Lincoln was beginning to observe the growth of pride and confidence in these black soldiers. See, blacks in uniform were learning something very valuable. They were learning something about the insularity of rank. They didn't have to yasser every little white man that came before them. They learned that a private was different from a sergeant, a sergeant was different from a captain, that all whites were not alike. Some were captains. Some were sergeants. And some were privates, just like them. I suspect Lincoln also grew because he met black people like Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth and Alexander Crumel and Martin Delaney, great black men and women. Now, I remember back when I was a young person, people would say to me, you know, you're not like them. You're just like us. They had no idea how insulting and offensive that was. They meant well. And perhaps it was that way with Lincoln. But perhaps having met one intelligent Negro, Lincoln was less surprised when he met the second. Suddenly his demand that some intelligent blacks be granted the suffrage reflects an acknowledgment that there were at least some intelligent blacks. Now, we live in a different era, and that may startle and confuse you, but I grew up at a time when white supremacy was legal, where my English teacher told me that I didn't have the intellectual capacity to graduate from college, and where the guy in my dorm down the hall thought all blacks should be shipped back to Africa. It wasn't that long ago. What about black people's interpretation? I think we've talked a little bit about the way in which Lincoln was serviceable. But for many African Americans, the name Lincoln symbolized their entry into full citizenship, into middle class status. And momentarily, they used this nomenclature uh, to escape the stigma of race. For many blacks, Lincoln came to symbolize empowerment and identity. 1866, Ashman Institute was renamed Lincoln University, became the first degree granting black college in America. The name Lincoln supplanted the word African. It's the most common appellation for African-American businesses and fraternal orders and banks and even beauty shops. We forget that for more than half a century in the late 19th and early 20th century, there were two institutions within the black community. One was the black church and the other were emancipation celebrations that would bring the entire community to guests, together. Beginning in 1865 and for decades after, thousands of African Americans would celebrate Emancipation Day on January the 1st. Even today, thousands of African American churches still hold watch meetings commemorating black expectancy on the eve of the original emancipation. In Louisiana and Texas and even in some places in the north, Emancipation Day is now Juneteenth, January, uh, June 19th a day of barbecue and music and revelry. Well, there's a lot more that I actually could talk about, but maybe we could talk a little bit about my personal Lincoln. My personal Lincoln is found in the third paragraph of his second inaugural. Apparently, most people in the audience didn't like it. It received some unfavorable comments in some of the papers, but Lincoln liked it. And Frederick Douglass liked it, and I liked it. It required reading in all of my classes. Not the malice toward none, Lincoln, or the, blind, or the bind up the nation's wounds, Lincoln, 
But my Lincoln's the Old Testament Lincoln. My Lincoln's the God's awful swift sword Lincoln in the third paragraph. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet if God wills that it continues until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrecorded toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Now, can you imagine any president of the United States saying that today? One nation's founding doc our nation's founding doctrine did not even mention slavery or anything that might even tangentially reference that not-so-particular institution was carefully excised by the House of Representatives recently when they had the public reading of the Constitution. They didn't want to go anywhere near it. We have so often in our past averted our gaze from the stark face of injustice, and here was Lincoln holding the sides of our face, firmly and forcing us to look, look at the reality of evil. What could easily have been another pathetic rondo of self-congratulations was turned into a moment of reflection. Lincoln had the audacity to say that one-eighth of the nation were black slaves. He mentioned black people. Notice there's no abstraction here. There's no mention of the free labor ideology or eating one's own bread here. One-eighth of the whole population, he wrote, were colored slaves. He didn't mention anything about colonization. It's as if Lincoln is finally free to say what he really thought or, or that a skilled politician is finally letting his guard down. It's not just a forced labor system anymore. It's people being forced to labor at the end of a lash. It's not just the slave owner that wielded that lash. It's all the decent Americans, North and South, who tolerated injustice and rose as the nation rose on the backs of the enslaved. It's a slave scarred back. It's the amputated toe of the runaway. It's the slave auction block. It's the half-remembered smile of some beautiful young child that her mother will never see again. Lincoln was saying attention must be paid. The bill had come due. Perhaps it is the saddest trope of American political history that great presidents grow in office. Perhaps we're all a little weary of hearing that old Comic Con that about the flexibility and the capacity of growth for Abraham Lincoln. But for me, it's the second inaugural. This is where Lincoln speaks to me. He's weary and he's sad. Perhaps he's just a touch fatalistic. But he speaks here of justice and renewal, and he speaks to the African-American experience. That's what's important, that in another time of trial and turbulence, a man of courage and integrity told the truth, asked a nation to look candidly at its own past, and summoned it to face an uncertain future with courage and resolve. And for this, and for so many other reasons, I believe Abraham Lincoln still speaks to us today. Thank you for this opportunity, and thank you for letting me come and talk to you today.